Welcome everyone to the ARCI video meeting number 11. It's hard to believe we've almost done a year of these things and uh, it's been a lot of fun and we continue to do this and we'll continue to do this on a monthly basis. So today is the 15th of May, 2021 and we have a, a great lineup of presentations and uh, you can see we have three of them right there. And the first thing I'm gonna do is turn it over to, to Matt before we get the presentations going. He'll talk a little bit about the fact that these are on YouTube. So, and after uh, Matt, it, I'll uh, introduce uh, Tom Kleinschmidt. He'll talk a little bit about the upcoming swap meet in June and a little bit perhaps about the swap meet that we just had. So Matt, are you ready to go? Things to consider now that we're on YouTube. Uh, I'll do this quickly because we've all heard it before. Uh, as we're going live, not live, but recorded on YouTube, uh, we need to remember that uh, this is a public forum. So uh, be careful about the information that you post. Uh, if you don't want it seen on YouTube, don't post it here. Uh, just a few items. Uh, when we record this, your names as they're displayed on the screen are not shown in YouTube. Uh, if you have your email or other contact information in a presentation as a presenter, uh, you might want to move that into chat. Chat's a great place to put all sorts of details that you don't want on YouTube. As an example, I will be putting the invitation to our next meeting on chat and as we typically do we will also be sharing the invitation to mark meeting tomorrow in the chat window you may hear the recording start and stop in your presentations please pay attention to any copyrighted material uh, youtube is particularly sensitive to copyrighted music and just in general respect the forum uh, you've heard Tom say this a thousand times, stay on mute. <laughs> there are appropriate times to unmute and those should be the only times that you unmute. All else is subject to change without notice as we figure this stuff out as we go. That's it. Hey Matt. <clears throat> yeah. What does it mean by band scans in your copyright material? Yes, yeah, so if you're restoring a radio and you're scanning the dial to show us how sensitive and selective your receiver is, and you pick up stations with playing music, YouTube will hear that uh, and consider that a copyright violation. There's some time limit to how long it'll listen to music before it considers it a copyright strike. I'm not sure exactly how it is. So it's better to, uh, if you're gonna stop on a station, uh, to stop on a talk radio station than a music station. You can play it for a few seconds and it's not a problem, but anything longer than X, 10, 15 seconds, something like that is a copyright strike. And your question, Tom? Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, before I turn it over to Tom, let me just quickly go through this, which is what I would like to do every month is uh, welcome all the other club members that have joined us from around the country and thank them for participating in the meeting and also being presenters. That's, that's a very key part of these meetings is to have presenters from other clubs. So it's, that's a great thing. And you should also consider being a presenter. It's really easy to do. Uh, some of the technical details we can help you with and uh, just think about it and, and join in these meetings. Our next meeting is June 26. It's a little later in the month than we've been having them, but that's what June's meeting is all about. It's the 26th. And if you need to send us any comments or questions, there's the email address right there for you to do that. And as Matt said, stay on mute unless you have a question or you're presenting, of course. So Tom, would you like to uh, tell us about the swap meet? Certainly. Um... A uh, couple things. Number one is we will, we traditionally have a Father's Day swap meet with the six meter ham club and with the uh, Midwest uh, boat anchors group. 
the DuPage County Fairgrounds where that's normally held is not taking reservations until we get to the next phase with uh, the state of Illinois. So that event is canceled, but we are having an ARCHI event at our lo normal location, I'll call it, uh, which is the American Legion Hall in Carroll Stream. And there was um, an email blast that went out to, should be everybody that's on this call or on this phone, uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, second, uh, April worked out real well. We had nice weather, we had a good turnout and Fortunately for me, we got a whole bunch of stuff out of our storage locker sold. Uh, I took up five parking spaces of donation materials that we, uh, that we sold and then we donated some and we scrapped some and we gave away some and so on. Uh, third item is Radio Fest. Again, because of how Illinois is being phased, although they're going to open things up, we just found out, I think it's June 11th, a little bit more. Um, we needed to get going back at the beginning of April. So we have canceled Radio Fest for this year and we'll be doing it next year. We're looking at what we're going to do in August as I'll call it a local meet. Um, and uh, the reason we're not having an equivalent to Radio Fest thing, uh, or I'll call it the flea market side of it at uh, the, uh, the Shriners is the cost of the venue uh, is just prohibitive. So we will be probably at the American Legion Hall, but I don't know that yet. And that's still, we're still working on that. So um, that's kind of the uh, swap meet update, unless anybody's got any questions. All right, back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Tom. Um, what I'm going to do now is introduce Dale Boyce. And uh, Dale is, uh, he lives up in Milwaukee and he's a long time radio collector researcher, you name it, he's done it. And um, he has put together a presentation on Briggs and Stratton and the radios and radio parts they made. And I got to tell you, I never knew that Briggs and Stratton made anything other than internal combustion engines. But um, I'll just, with that being said, I'll turn it over to Dale. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm up in Milwaukee. I'm the radio collector, and I've been looking for the Briggs and Stratton radio for a long time. And uh, I get distracted easily. Um, the deer that looks in the window looking for her fawn and the fawn that's outside wiggling its ears and saying, I can run faster than you. So here's the uh, 19, uh, 2013 uh, slide. This is a Briggs and Stratton display I had at Radio Fest. This is table one of three. There were three eight foot tables with display on it. I also did a PowerPoint presentation during the seminars that year. Here's the culprit. This has been the focus of my collection, of my search, not my collection, but 2011 uh, was successful. I had ads around in several clubs and the ad I had in the Northland Antique Radio Club caught the eye of somebody in Iowa who found one of these things. Here's a blow up of the nameplate. Um, Briggs and Stratton used that diamond logo on all of their products from about, uh, starting about 2000, uh, 1913 into the twenties. And they riveted it on the Bakelite front of the radio. Here's my reward for the display that I had at Radio Fest, a blue ribbon in the category, the People's Choice Award for all the people that came through the contest room and voted, and then the Best of Show Award from Dr. and Mrs. Ralph Mucko. Those are, uh, those are pretty prized things in my collection here. The, my Basco Radio search started back in 1984. I've been collecting for 15 years. I had a two person tour of the Mucko Museum in 1980. I had a tour of Joe Pavick's museum up in Minneapolis in 1982, uh, before the museum moved to St. Louis Park. And I was inspired by both of those guys and the, uh, their collections and the diversity of their collections. So I'm not a one manufacturer collector here. I, 
And of course, I collect speakers, horn speakers and cone speakers and earphones. And I found this 1984 book by Floyd Paul. He was out on the West Coast, but uh, in the book, he had tables and copies of stuff. This is 1925, March, radio retailing, a list of headsets. And in there is the Briggs and Stratton listing for two different types of headsets. So 1925, it's like, yeah, I didn't know they made anything other than lawnmower engines. I grew up on a farm in Western Minnesota. And this was news to me. I'd recently moved to Milwaukee and I drove by their plant frequently. So I started a search for the headsets. And this was the first one I came up with, the 2000 ohm. And if you look at how the, the spring steel on both sides, uh, you adjust the headband by pinching the spring steel and sliding it up or down, depending on the size of your cranium. So a lot of headphone manufacturers have pretty complicated uh, mechanical connectors up there. This is simple spring steel. So uh, the left side is 2000 ohm and the right side 3000 ohm. They did all their own foundry work, so they had access to aluminum casting and and uh, all the imprinting and painting. And then a fellow collector directed me to uh, uh, Morgan McMahon's Blue Book Radio Collector Guide for 1921 to 32. It's Morgan McMahon's version, updated version of the Ralph Langley listing of radios. And the bottom line you see here is Briggs and Stratton 1923 crystal. That was the first indication that I had that Briggs and Stratton made a crystal set. So that added to the search. So I started digging in my library through the 1920s radio magazines. I found in Radio News, uh, January 1923, they had this full page ad and also QST in February, 1923, had the same ad. And it's a fairly extensive line of the Briggs and Stratton company radio products. Now you'll see the crystal radio on there and you see the earphones. All the rest of those products were made for uh, putting into tube type battery radios that could be assembled from parts in the twenties, either assembled by hobbyist or purchased by companies and assembled into complete radios. Well, the list on the left is a is just a blow up of the uh, the list of the parts here. So another advertisement a, a friend gave me. This is from upstate New York, Utica, New York. It's up on I-90 between Rochester and Albany. Uh, Briggs and Stratton radio equipment was distributed across the country through their automotive and equipment distribution network. The radio equipment was stocked, sold, and serviced by the same dealers. So if you knew where your Briggs dealer was, you could find it. And trying to find old stock in the in old Briggs places is a, is a challenge. This is an uh, image of a Briggs and Stratton tube socket, note they're split. When they're, they're black in the metal, uh, etched black metal, they're riveted to the base. And this one has a couple of fuse clips attached. And it's not a Briggs and Stratton fuse, it's a cartridge capacitor, 0. 0.0003 microfarads. There's another shot of that. These were connected in the, the grid leak part of the circuit on a tube type radio. These were not used in the crystal radio. No tubes, no capacitors, uh, lots of things you didn't need in a, in a crystal radio, just antenna and a ground and, and earphone connections. Here's a couple of uh, other Briggs and Stratton sockets. They imprinted their name, Briggs and Stratton Company, Milwaukee on the one side and the Basco Diamond logo around the corner there. And when you look in the radio from the top, you can't see them because they're stamped in the black metal. 
So I added the whitening in here to make these show up better in the pictures. Now, similar to other radio companies, Atwater Kent and others, the automotive products preceded the radios. Briggs and Stratton was started in 1908. According to one book, they were working on radio as early as 1910. Other references indicate they were making automotive ignition equipment for at least 75 automobile companies just all over the country. Uh, an update on Briggs and Stratton is that in 2020, a private equity firm agreed to buy all of Briggs and Stratton's assets. You can find a lot more about that and their history online. Here's a couple images of a Briggs and Stratton automotive dashboard, circa 1950. I know there's some car buffs out there that may have this uh, a similar dashboard in their vehicle. One thing you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner is there's a key in this lock, in this switch. And that's a Briggs and Stratton key in a Briggs and Stratton lock cylinder. And they sold those all over the world. They're still selling locks and keys. I had visits all over the country with radio collectors and museum collections, museum curators, uh, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, even London. Uh, talked to Dr. Macau and his museum at Elgin, Joe Pavick up in Minneapolis, Bruce Kelly at AWA in the, the AWA Museum out in New York, Bob Piquette uh, from Milwaukee with his microphone museum and private collections around the country. My wife and I even spent a better part of a day with Gerald Wells at the British Vintage Wireless Museum in East Dulwich, uh, England, just outside of London. Uh, some of these people knew about Briggs and Stratton radio, but none of them knew about the crystal. So there is a one time member of Wisconsin club who knew about the crystal radio in Iowa. He knew the owner. He said he learned about radio construction from this guy that lived down by the Quad Cities. And one of the radio collectors in the Illinois club from the Quad Cities area said, yeah, he knew that owner and he knew about that radio, but he could never get it out of the family. Even after the guy died, he, the family kept the radio. Uh, back in 2011, I was visited by a radio collector from Australia. He didn't know about the crystal radio, but he knew about Briggs and Stratton radio from an Australia radio newsletter that had an article about the, uh, the lawnmower radio. And back in 2014, uh, the host of Tube Talk uh, interviewed me about Basco Radio and the Wisconsin Antique Radio Club. I know Paul, the host, uh, interviewed several other members of the, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Club and the Illinois Club. Now, this is the first image I ever saw of the Briggs and Stratton Crystal Radio. Um, they did a lot of advertising in 1922, April, May, June. They had just text ads. August and September, this image showed up. Uh, that was important to me. Here's a detailed shot. It shows the the crystal, the cat's whisker, there's Galena down in the cup. And in 1989, I met with a Briggs and Stratton archivist. I saw the original ink on vellum drawings, 30 by 42, huge drawings of the complete radio, bill of materials, all the parts, and a separate drawing that showed the cat's whisker, that whole assembly. This is from 1922 catalog that I got from the um, Maurice Seavers. It shows how they were, uh, the numbers of the assigned and, par and prices and such. I got a set of headphones in a box in, in 2012 at Radio Fest. Uh, all of their parts were packaged in orange and black boxes. So I'm looking for those boxes too. If you find one, I'm interested. <laughs> 
or even more than one. The ad on the right side is a typical ad that they've been running in 1922 and 23 and thereafter for the headphones. A fellow Wisconsin member, Glenn, uh, was kindly obliged let me photograph his radio frequency transformer. These are advertised in some of the radio magazines, but I've never found one in real life. He let me photograph his RFT front and back. And this is two of the four sides of the box. So an example of what they, what they came in. Searching for documentation, I mentioned that catalog. I got that from her receivers. Uh, I also got the bulk of his library, 1900 to 1930 radio catalogs that he used in production of his crystal clear uh, books. Uh, I also acquired several crystal radios directly from him. And my thanks go out to publisher George Fatauer, who I've known for a long time or making the introduction to Maurice because Maurice didn't know me from anyone and George was kind to make that introduction. Radio collectors are a great, great group of people. Here's the cover of that Briggs and Stratton catalog. Inspiration and help at Lake Michigan, my wife, Chris, and Max and Molly. Here's an image of a, a Globe 610 with mostly Briggs and Stratton parts. Globe, Monroe, Airline, Montgomery Ward radios with Briggs parts. The porthole radio is the first clue. They came in lots of different cabinet styles. The single tube and the three tube. And the, if you look at the chassis of the radio on the top image, it's basically identical to the one on the bottom image. They just rotated the two tuners. So the top is globe, the rest of them are airline. And Monroe, you'll find the Monroe labels and uh, other labels on companies that were involved in making these. Whoop, distracted by the buck and velvet. Now, why would that distract anybody? <laughs> There's a fawn that was saw by the garden one day. She stayed quiet while I took the picture and she was busy having supper when I got this shot. This is right out the front window. So here's my first airline deluxe radio with Briggs and Strand parts. Thanks to Greg, I miss him. There's another one of these deluxe radios that's in a little better shape that lived in a cabinet all its life. You can see the Briggs and Stratton logo on the tube sockets with the blackened metal or the, the etched black metal. This shows a couple of the an underside of the Briggs and Stratton tube socket with the little, excuse me, the paper foil condensers. Another close up of the little condensers. 003 microfarad. Again, part of the grid leak circuitry. This shows the, the uh, cartridge type capacitor behind the socket and the foil capacitor is kind of peeking out underneath. There's another shot of that. More help, Hunter Molly, always after critters and Cool Max taking it easy on a hot summer day. I miss them too. Next time, I've got a bunch of information on the Briggs and Stratton battery eliminators. Uh, they were making those as well as lots of other companies. And I've got information. Radio Fest 2013. After my uh, PowerPoint presentation, I went out to see how things were going at the donation auction, because that's always interesting. Well, they were dealing with, with the great flood of 2013. How much water are you guys holding up there, Tom? There's it Molly. Was, uh, it was it was pouring. <laughs> yeah, it's coming off the edge there, uh, pretty heavy. And 
Molly picking tomatoes from the outside of the garden. She did not gently pick them. She <laughs> loved tomatoes. Here's a uh, Baltimore Oriole, a radio fan of mine, reminding me to fill the bird bath and the bird feeder. There's Bullwinkle in velvet. I see him about once a year, and it's coming up in June here. They should be in velvet again. Later in the fall, they shed the velvet, and this is uh, this is again in the front yard, right by a uh, right by the locust tree. And turkeys. I might like turkeys. We get turkeys. Why do they cross the driveway? Well, to get to the neighbors, and they deposit fertilizer all year long, so they can't be too bad. This guy looked in the window on winter day, <laughs> wondering what I was eating. It was not turkey. And until next time, here's a parting shot from my three of my fans. They're headed to the swing set. And I'd like to shout out thanks to Chris, my wife, radio collecting partner for 38 interesting years, the Archie Zoom team, Archie and Archie members. <clears throat> near and around the world, family and friends who are no longer with us. And I'd like to let you know you can look at on the Wisconsin radio site or, or articles I did in July and September of 2013 and in Radio Age, October 2013 and 2014. And I want to thank Jean Ann and Greg for editing those articles and seeing that they got published out with the Radio Age people. So that's the end of the presentation and uh, I'm going horse. <laughs> if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. I got a question, Dale. Um, what's the significance between the 2000 and 3000 ohm headsets? Well, they were, they were made for different, um, using on different radios. Some of Is the it? crystal sets perform better on the 3000 ohm, the high resistance headsets. Oh, okay. So uh, having the, the 3000 is better than a 2000. Well, if you're listening on a crystal radio, yeah. Okay. If you look through literature of other manufacturers, most of them are 2000. Sometimes you'll see 1750 or 1500 or even lower. But the 3000 ones are kind of hard to come by. Well, thanks for the question, Rudy. Okay. Any other questions for Dale? Well, thank you, Dale. That was an awesome presentation of not just radios, but all the, the fauna around your house there. You, you certainly <laughs> live in a uh, wildlife preserve there. Yeah, I'm and, really lucky to live here in Milwaukee and this... In but this I'm, I'm very impressed by the uh, depth and extent of your research efforts, and uh, that's that's awesome stuff. And uh, you know, it's it's pretty amazing that you've accumulated all that Briggs and Stratton stuff. That's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, I thank you again for all your help. So, if there's no further questions for Dale, we can uh, expect to see part two, hopefully next month on the 26th, and. Uh, He's going to talk about the battery eliminator products from Briggs and Stratton. And um, <clears throat> we're now going to go back to Charlie Wright and see part two of his collection. We saw part one last month, and that was fascinating. So, Charlie, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Um, first of all, I thought I'd ask if there's any questions remaining from last month's, what I showed last month. Is there any follow up to anything there before I start. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. We'll uh, see if I can get this thing on here. Oh, Charlie, I do have a question for you. This is Dan. Okay. Cole. okay. Uh, on your RCA Regenoflex, the one I have has a key lock in the upper right hand corner. Correct. Um, is by chance, do you have the key for yours? I do have a key for mine now. Okay. When you got a chance sometime, can you look and see if that is a Briggs and Stratton key? Oh, okay, I'll Most do that. Most have Briggs and Stratton key. It's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a check. That's an interesting thing to check. I'll do that. 
In fact, I'll do it after my presentation and let you know today. Okay, so I did uh, the bigger room of my collection last time. This is the next room. Uh, my first real job was in radio, so I, I tried to acquire duplicates of all the equipment I used to use back in the 60s. And uh, this is the Ampex 300 professional reel-to-reel, -reel, which anyone that was in radio would know exactly what that is. Um, a radio control console uh, made by Gates Radio Company. And there's another view of the same thing. Uh, some of my little memorabilia on the wall. There's a refrigerator top radio there. Um, another view, this is an Ampex 400, which was came out after the 300, which didn't work near as well as the 300 because it was solid state, <laughs> which at the time didn't work so well. And there's an Ampex 602, which was another mainstay of radio stations. And there's a uh, I uh, <clears throat> DeForest D10 sitting there in between them. Uh, up above the doorway there, I got a Western Electric 7A amplifier with uh, tennis ball tubes and an interesting Halicrafters with a, uh, a brass front on it and a neutral wound radio. Um, here I've got one of these uh, corner Stromberg Carlson consoles, which you don't see too many of. And there's a Radiola 24 portable. Um, a FADA and a Grieb synchrophase. Uh, first row. Um, there's a number of my AC sets on this row. I'd say most of what I have is battery sets, but I did get, I do have a few AC sets. Um, I've also got a couple of cylinder phonographs up on the top. So radio at 33 there on an Ozarka. Um, couple of early TVs on the bottom, a 7-inch and a 10-inch with the round tubes. Uh, it's a radio a 17 with a, with a Victor phonograph combination. Uh, again, a closer shot of some of my AC radios. There's nothing of of extreme consequence there, but they're ones that I liked and I thought were attractive. Um, now we're across the aisle. Uh, here's a Marconi. Um, here's a little pilot three inch television up here. And the rest are mostly battery sets, uh, some battery consoles along the bottom. Uh, this is the same aisle from the opposite view. Uh, you can see again here I've got some of these suspended shelves that are attached with all thread to the bar or to the uh, floor joist. That way I can move around these radios on the bottom. It works quite handily for making sure I don't waste any space since I don't have much to waste. <laughs> Um, this is an interesting item here. It was a combination uh, 7 inch TV, 45 RPM record player, AM and FM radio, all in one little two foot box. Um, here's a very, very early CRT. It only has four pins on the base. Um, an old battery jar, 
there. Um, okay, we're back to... I've got a collection of old and unusual tubes sitting on the shelf above there. There is actually a little ledge on there for possible earthquakes. <laughs> so hopefully they won't fall off. Um, this over here is a medical quack device. It has all kinds of spark gaps and knife switches and stuff, which I thought was a really cool item. But I haven't tried it out. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, this is the RCA Deluxe 3A. And this is RCA Super Hedridine with a phono combination. Some more old tubes. Uh, another view is the same. There's a Radiola 28 setting up there. No, that's not the 28, that's 25, I think. Um, federal uh, 110. Okay, there's another view of the same. There's my Crosley grandmother clock. Um, there's a Radiola 28. This is the third aisle. Um, kind of an overview of the aisle. Uh, same aisle from the other direction. Uh, this is a closer view of some of those radios. There's some Fried Eismans down on the bottom. Uh, Radiola 2 there. And another one of my side collections, uh, telephone pole insulators along the top. As if I don't have enough junk already. Um, another view of the same row, uh, like I say, mostly three dial sets, uh, some various manufactured tube boxes, more of the insulators up at the top. Um, and this is the last row in the room. Um, a uh, closer view, there's a couple of my cathedrals that snuck in between the battery radios. Um, we've got a big brass power meter there, a Radiola 26 portable. Uh, opposite view of the row you saw before, looking back over the radial 18 and 19, uh, radial super hedridine, some more battery jars up on the top. And this is back to the first view you saw with the radial 24 and the grieve up at the top. So that's that room. Is there any questions about anything in that room? Yeah, when are you going to set up uh, some tours? Say again? When are you going to set up some tours? I, I heartfully welcome anyone that's in the club that ever is in the Kansas City area to come by. I'd be very happy to entertain you. <laughs> it's a phenomenal, phenomenal collection you got there. Well, it's it's been a fun 30-year hobby, and uh, so far it's it's been fun. Hey, Charlie, what was the last radio you bought? Uh, I got a a uh, best tone um, phono panel. I got that at one of uh, 
the auctions uh, that uh, um, forgetting my names now. The auctioneer down in Texas, uh, Jim Sargent. Sargent, yeah, I got it. His auction. Uh, I kind of like these phono panel sets because the tubes stick out. And I, as you might have already noticed, I like radios that you can see the tubes. And uh, this best tone, I've never even heard of the brand before, but there is a picture. No, there's not a picture of it in this because I took these pictures before I got that. That was radio number 619, I believe. And, and the follow-up question, have you ever sold a radio? I do have a storage area with duplicates, or I, I haven't done, I've done very little refinishing, so most of these radios are what you'd call as found. Um, I try to as find good ones, <laughs> but if I get a better one, the, the lesser one will go out into storage, and I have a spreadsheet that has locations of everything, so if if you were to call and say, do you have a Stromberg Carlson 1A or something like that, I can tell you right away if I have an extra one and I'd be more than happy to sell it or trade it. I probably haven't sold more than a dozen or so. I, I sell most of the plastics I get at swap meets because I'm not really a plastics guy, as you can probably already tell from seeing the pictures. So I do, and I have sold a few wood 40s radios as well, um, but I do like some some of the 30s and 40s radios in the collection as well. So the the short answer is not very many. <laughs> okay. You've also got a, a a large assortment of oscilloscopes and uh, other test gear. If you're looking. I have uh, a 3,000 square foot building full of equipment. So anyone that comes should plan to spend a couple hours looking through stuff to see what they need. <laughs> I mean, if you need something really odd, a certain kind of relay or panel light or knob or something like that, I may be able to help you. Okay, well, let's get into room three. This actually was the laundry room, and the only thing remaining in it that's laundry is a washer and dryer. And the wife says it's kind of hard to do laundry in between the radios, but that's sort of how it is. <laughs> so this is one half of the room. Um, let me get my cheat sheet here. Uh, this console over here, I've never seen another one like it. It's an AK-60. I call it my console cathedral. And it works fine. It's, it's it, yeah, absolutely original condition. Uh, but I kind of like that one. Uh, I got a silver tone clock there. Uh, next picture. Uh, again, here's some of my... Uh, floating shelves <laughs> to let me put things underneath. Um, there's a Crosley XJ there, Freed Eisman. These are Freed Eisman's in fancy open door cabinets that are, are really cool. You open the door and there's room for the batteries inside. Uh, there's a Kennedy 20 among others. Um, this is a, uh, I've been told is a Victorine, uh, super hat kit. Uh, it's on a breadboard and I don't think it's the entire radio, but there's six tubes and six coils. Um, but it's a really interesting piece. Uh, ACK console there, AK-19. Um, down here is an Adler Royal phono panel. Now, you'll notice my phono panels, I built boxes to put them all in because they came without cabinets. So I had to construct 
cabinets for those. Um, here we have a, uh, here's a Marconi's 55 portable there. Uh, that's another view of the Fried Eisman um, and several other battery sets. Uh, another view, uh, there's a, it's just, that's the same items, just another. Harley? Yes. What's the, uh, the red colored radio in the middle there? That is an Ozarka. And it says so on the top, this front panel, I'm thinking may have been replaced because it doesn't look very, it kind of doesn't look, but I can't find a picture of either this one or one with a different panel. So, but it is an Ozarka. Um, this is a Malone Lemon. I've only seen one radio of that brand. It's a really classy looking radio. Uh, radio is 62. Um, there's a Greeb CR12, uh, DeForest F5. Okay, the other side of the room has my beautiful pink shelves that I got a garage sale and haven't gotten around to repainting. Okay, on this side, we've got a Federal 102, a Steinite, a Radiola 2 in a box. And this is a kind of cool uh, piece of test equipment for, uh, it's actually a great big resistance decade, which I thought was worthy of showing. Um, on this side, we got a uh, Grebe CR3 down here. Uh, oh, down here, okay. Uh, Grebe ROD amplifier. Uh, DeForest D4. Kennedy 521 amp. Uh, Federal 57. Uh, Parmark. Uh, Kennedy 281 up there, uh, cut, cutting in Washington 11A, and a Federal 58 up on the top. Uh, this is my DeForest D17 with the loop antenna and a sleeper monotrol on top, also with a loop antenna. In the background's my thousand gallon water storage tank. We're kind of self sufficiency nuts around here. Um, and the next little shelf has a, there's a DT 800 amplifier there. Uh, Kennedy 111 portable, which is kind of a hard to find radio. Uh, freshman president right there. And there's an Everetti Model 2 AC set with matching speaker. That's a metal radio. And my... Charlie, yes? The, the, the radio to the right of this clock that's uh, second from the bottom that has the cutout uh, fret work on it. Uh, Go yeah. down. There you go. Those are all speakers. Those are all speakers. Okay. Yeah, those are all speakers. I kind of like speakers as well as radios. And I usually, if I see one I don't have, I end up taking it home. <laughs> you know, do you know who made, do you know who made that one? Uh, I, I would say probably I know, but I don't know at the moment. <laughs> That's not a very good answer, but it's the best one I got. Actually, some of those speakers don't have any brand names on them. And I think that may be one of them. So that's all. Um, if there's any other questions. Hey, Charles. 
hopefully your uh, thousand gallon uh, water tank never springs a leak. Uh, I do have sufficient drainage down there to prevent a flood. <laughs> um, and I also have a water monitor. So if I get any water on the floor or rings this bell, it'll wake the dead up. So, so far we haven't lost anything to flooding. <laughs> hey, Charlie, the beginning of your presentation, you had some broadcast equipment. Do you collect that as well? I have quite a bit of uh, what I would call professional or, or laboratories equipment that is in wooden cases. These were made by companies like General Radio, uh, things like impedance bridges and uh, decade boxes and stuff like that. I have uh, a whole corner in my storeroom full of that stuff. Uh, like those meters that are in the wood cases that have the big six inch dials and so I've got quite a bit of, as far as test equipment I use I have a rather modest shop uh, you know I know some of the people I've heard on the on the on the uh, zoom here have ob obviously much nicer shops than I do um, I guess I could say I have a legacy shop it has things like uh, uh, like CRT uh, oscilloscopes and VTVMs and uh, Simpson and triplet meters, you know, all that old stuff. <laughs> so that's about the extent of that. Well, that was a great presentation, Charlie. And, uh, you know, I think we could probably safely say you've got one of the largest battery set collections on the planet, I think. Well, I do know of one that's bigger and he's in my club in, in Kansas City and he's just bought a, uh, I think about a 50,000 square foot building and he's gonna st open a museum in uh, Topeka. And, he may end up with part of this collection in his, although he's, I probably don't have two dozen radios that he doesn't already have. <laughs> so, but I enjoy it and it's, uh, you know, I got in early enough where a good part of the collection was $5 radios. Yeah, now they're all $100 radios or more, so. Well, you've done a great job, Charlie, and, um, and we really right. appreciate it. Well, I've, had, I've enjoyed this opportunity to be able to share it. And like I say, I hope a few of you come by sometime. Yeah, there you go, guys. Next time you're down around Kansas City, pay uh, Charlie a visit. I'm sure, he, I'm sure you'll walk away with something. I'm 50 miles north of Kansas City, St. Joe, Missouri. Well, thanks, Charlie. It's been a it's been a good two months of great presentation from your uh, collection there. We really enjoyed it. So, thank uh, you. Uh, so uh, with that, any other questions for Charlie? Otherwise, we'll move on to our third presentation of the morning, which will be from Greg Van Beek. He's going to give us a part one tour of his collection. So. Greg is up in the, uh, in Wisconsin, and he'll uh, he'll go from from right now. Ready, Greg? I'm ready. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Uh, I'm actually located about 35 miles north of Milwaukee, so I'm not too far from Dale, and I've actually been to his home a few times and seen his incredible collection of the Briggs radios. And I'm hoping that at some point he'll consider doing a virtual tour of his collection as well, because it's really outstanding. And, I was inspired by one of the first ones here when Art did his virtual tour. I think he just took his cell phone or laptop or tablet around and showed off his radios. And that gave me the idea because I'm sitting in the basement here surrounded by radios. So I figured uh, there's about 54 of them down here. I'll just take my tablet and show what I've got. And that's roughly half of what I have. The other half I'll show next month in part two is a, is a video. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say is uh, 
some of you may be a member of the Wisconsin Antique Radio Club as well, and uh, may have seen me present this in March at their Zoom meeting. So apologies to those few people who are seeing a rerun. <laughs> so with that said, let me change the camera around here. I also collect some Bing Crosby memorabilia. That's a big uh, poster from a drugstore from 1953. This is a 49 Filco portable. They came in several different colors. I've got the matching advertisement down here featuring Bing. He didn't just advertise the 1201s. This is a 53 Transitone. Here's the famous Philco Hippo. They made these from 1946 to 49. And then in 1950, they became the sundial. Some people call them sundial sunburst. It's a model of 50-922. Trying to keep it in focus here. Here's the little RCA from 1939. Little 1X2. This is a uh, 39 Emerson, big Strad. Six tube uh, 41 Zenith. Now here's a Zenith portable. 1840. There we go, coming in. And moving over here to a few consoles. This one is significant to me because it's the first radio I ever received. This was a 1940 Coronado console was purchased new by my great grandparents at the Gamble store on Main Street in Hartford, Wisconsin. And I remember this all my life. I remember being a toddler going up to this thing when I wasn't even as tall as it. So they moved into assisted living around 1980 and my grandmother got it for me. And so they had it the first 40 years. Now I've had it for 40 years. It's got a lot of bands to it, which is surprising for Coronado. This is a 46 Philco console. It's got the record player in it. And uh, this actually is, I'm the second owner of this as well. This came from a family friend whose parents bought it new. Let's see, moving up here. This is the extent of my 20s collection. The main focus that I'm interested in is 30s and early 40s wood cabinet sets, but I've got a few pet water cans that are fairly common. This is a 1928 to model 40. Here's a little 4-tube Atwater Kent, model 944. This is kind of interesting. This is a, a Belmont, it's a 1932, 33. It's model 60. I haven't seen a lot of information on this. It's hard to find a schematic for it, but as you can see, the cabinet is kind of based on that Combs design that Philco had in 1931, which is, let's see, like this. This is a Model 70 Baby Grand. We got the Model uh, 20. We got labels under all these. They're not really showing up too well because of the glare, but uh, the radios, I think, are coming through. This is a 37 Airline Movie Dial. Model 62-418. I know... Uh, Tom is interested in some of those, airline. A couple of phones on top of there. This is a Grinnell, Grinnell model 640, 1935. Nice airplane dial. Is it Grinnell or Grunau? Grunau, that's what I'm wondering too. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? I always pronounce it as a Grunau. Grunau, that's that's works for me. What does the rest of the room say? <laughs> <laughs> Got a 37 Philco model 610 with the original faux finish on the front. That's what attracted me to that because you 
don't always find them where most of it is intact like this. Let's see, moving down here, I've got a in my tube tester, I've got a 36 silver tone, a little 4365, big gold dial. And I've got some radio show advertising here too. And burning show. Little four tube, uh, 37 Philco model, 37-84 with the full finish. 39 Philco battery set. 1930 Echo phone, model S3. I think I read somewhere that uh, the toss up between this one and the 1930 model 20 Philco as to which was the first cathedral. I'm sure someone out there may have more information on that, but it's going to be one of the first. Let's see. Here's a uh, 52 RCA. Another four tube Philco. Another 37 Philco, 37 600. This is the one I was trying to show on the Zoom a few months ago where I redid the full finish on there just using toners and it was all sanded off. Got a uh, 37 Traveler. And a really pretty dial when it lights up. Got a American Bosch model 420, a little cigar box. 36 Crosley. Blue dial zenith, little six tuber. 51 Arvin. This is actually the same chassis that's used in the Hopalong Cassidy radio. So if you happen to have a Hopalong Cassidy set that needs a chassis or you've got problems with it, you can find these a lot cheaper than the than Hoppy. <laughs> Let's see some tubes here. This big guy is a 38 Philco. Well, 38-5, kind of half cathedral, half tombstone. The last year that Philco had the shadow meter. After that, they went to push buttons in 39. They never had a magic eye tube in a Philco. This is a 36, a 37 silver tone, which I'm told has an Ingram cabinet. Model 4669, telephone dial for uh, presets. Get rid of the glare a little bit. 38 Philco with the concentric tuning. That's the only table model they made with that feature. Here's a 39 slant front. With the red push buttons. 42 model 350. Has the early FM band. This is a 1937 RCA model 86T1 that I turned into an 87T1 by adding the I tube. It was the only difference in the chassis. Found a bezel and I found a Amphenol kit and wired it in. 36 Philco tombstone, model 630. This is part of an early tube tester. This makes a nice display with a couple of dud tubes in it, but uh, looks kind of neat. Up here, we've got a uh, 39 RCA model T60 that has the I tube in the center. I've got my can of Fibrogy and Molly glow coat from 1946. Collect radio show memorabilia as well. Some Hytron tube advertising on top of a 37 Grunau teledial model 588. Here's a Philco sled 41. 46 Zenith with the reverse Chevron dial. More radio show advertising above there. That's a huge 
banner, I think, was from my subway car from 1934 advertising the Ed Wynn show. It was on for Texaco. 39 Zenith. This is the uh, 42 Zenith. They're pretty common. Another airline, 1936, 62-317. 38 General Electric. Kind of unusual with the dial on the left. Most of them had the speaker on the left, dial on the right. Stromberg Carlson, 1935, 61H. We have a Fairbanks Morris, 1938. Down here is a 49 Philco, model 1401. That was the last year they made it with the slide-in record player. It's kind of got the boomerang styling going on there. This is a 41 Philco, model 41-623P. And what's unusual about it, it has the beam of light tone arm. Here. We move on to council row here. These are five Zenith councils. It's a 1940, 8S463, 38 shutter dial, nine tube. Here's a 1938 Zenith. Uh, 8S, I think it's 4, 8, 854. Original finish. This is a, uh, the first Philco 33 and a third RPM record player. This was an attachment came out in June of 1948. And it actually has an RCA plug on it. So I've got it plugged in the back of the Zenith. But that's the very first 33 and a third commercial record player. These two are both uh, the same Zenith, same uh, model, I should say. They're both six tube. One on the right is a 1937 model. The one on the left is a 36, both uh, six tube councils. And I think I've covered it all. Yeah. Hey, great. Here. Yes. For you. Uh, okay. Zenith Blue Dial Radio. Could you yes. show that again? Zenith Blue Dial Radio. Okay. Yeah. Could you show that again? I, I, I haven't seen a lot of Zeniths with blue dial on them. Yeah. It's kind of hard to see from the angle there. but. Yeah. I'm trying to get so it doesn't glare so much for you. but It's just a, like an aluminum plate, but it's kind of anodized blue the way it looks. Yeah, I, does anybody know if Zenith made a lot of models with blue dials like that? Not sure. I think it might have just been a forty-one thing. That was the only that that particular radio is the only one I've ever seen. Uh, that's yeah, it's very unusual. I've never never seen mm -hmm. one. Okay, I'm trying to reverse the camera back here. Let's see. Oh, well, Greg, that that tour of your uh, your collection there is outstanding, and I know we've got part two coming up next month, so I, we look forward to that. But I must say, you've got a, a broad a variety of different kinds of radios, there you go. And quite an eclectic collection there. Yeah, it's a lot of different things. It's nothing that's exceptionally rare or anything, but you know, they're just things that appeal to me. Yeah, it's a beautiful collection, and uh, you should be very proud of it. And thank you. It's an inspiration to us all to to go out and collect things. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Say this, Charlie. Uh, I notice your radios are all in pristine condition. Did you refinish or restore most of your sets? Yeah, they're all restored, Charlie. I I did went through the chassis and the cabinets. A lot of them have original finishes. I was able to preserve. Some of them are refinished, but uh, 
that's that's my hobby. I go through both things. I think you've done a very nice job with it. Well, thank you. And I, I must compliment you on your collection. I was overwhelmed by the scope and size of what you all have there. That's tremendous. I wish I had that much space to store some of mine. Well, you know, I had this vision when I retired that I'd uh, refinish and clean up every set. And I, that hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I like I say, I try to find ones that are at least presentable the way they mm -hmm. are. But, sure. but yeah, you've got looks like museum quality stuff there. Well, thank you. They don't all have to work. It's nice just to be able to look at them, too. You know? yeah, I want to give you my compliments as well, Greg. You've got a really nice collection that you've put together there. Well, thank you, Dale. Like I said, I hope someday you'll consider showing a tour of your collection because it's amazing compared to mine, I'll tell you. You've got more battery sets than I've ever seen in person in my life. Yeah, they go back away. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. And if there's no further questions for Greg or compliments, certainly a lot of compliments there, uh, we'll, we'll uh, say that this concludes our section on presentations. And um, at this point, we always like to put out a poll to see if you're interested in being a presenter. And, and really, you don't have to have a collection as extensive as Charlie's or Greg's to give us a tour of yours. It's, it's more like sharing what you, what you collect and, and what you're interested in. And, but you can also do a presentation on something that's of interest to you that might be of interest to us. So uh, consider being a presenter. If you've already answered this and coordinated with one of the Zoom team uh, about your presentation, you don't need to tell us again, but if you were a new presenter, uh, please let us know. Yeah, this is Charlie. Uh, Dale was wanting to know about the key in my Regenoflex. And it is, in fact, a Briggs & Stratton. Um, has the diamond logo on one side and Milwaukee, Wisconsin on the other. Oh, that's great. That's very interesting. So I actually do have a Briggs and Stratton item in my collection. I didn't even know it. <laughs> Thanks for checking, Charlie. <laughs> Thanks for checking. I, I appreciate knowing that. What about your lawnmowers, Charlie? Maybe maybe one of your lawnmowers is good. It's a it's a uh, yeah. I think it. You know, I think it's got a uh, lawn boy or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make a joke, but uh, I think you can see the results there of our poll. Um, got a few people interested. That's good, but think about it and uh, please consider being a presenter in the future. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so at this point, we move on to the show and tells. We have a couple of those uh, on tap here. And then after we do the show and tells, we do our items, wanted items for sale. At that point, I'll turn it over to Tom Kleinschmidt. But for right now, whoever would like to do their show and tell, please uh, step forward. Uh, hello? I volunteer. Okay, Michael. Let's we'll start this. Um, at the uh, last swap meet, uh, I walked off with a box of uh, miscellaneous parts and you never know what you're gonna find. Uh, this kind of rooting around the bottom of the box, these caught my eye. This is, I don't know if you can all see this. This is a, a general radio uh, quartz crystal type 1900 dash, uh, was it 2300 I think. And uh, it's, you can see it's a, a crystal element uh, encased in glass. Uh, just for uh, scale, I can compare it to this, uh, uh, this uh, 6BK5. Uh, yeah, right, like that. Um, and it's, uh, so it's about the size of a large uh, miniature tube. Uh, 
it's a, you know extremely well made. It looks like it must have been very expensive, and I had no idea at all what it was. I, I did some uh, research on it, and it turns out it's actually a, uh, cris a crystal filter element. Uh, I don't know if I can bring it up, but it's from a, uh, let's see here, uh, General Radio 1900A Wave Analyzer. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, basically, the, uh, the unit, uh, the 1900A was a low frequency uh, basically, I guess, 20 hertz to 50 kilohertz uh, spectrum analyzer without a CRT, if you can imagine that. Uh, it, instead of displaying on a CRT, it would draw a, um, a chart, it would draw on a chart recorder. And it was a big rack mount unit, and uh, it featured four of these. Um, and uh, it, uh, the, it, these are actually 100 kilohertz filter elements, uh, the, uh, the, there was a variable bandwidth adjust on this, uh, this unit. Uh, it had a minimum, a lowest bandwidth, I think, of 3 hertz, and the widest was uh, 50 hertz. But, uh, um, yeah, I have no, no idea if these are good or not. They look like they were pulls from, uh, from a unit. Uh, they're quite attractive. Uh, there's a total of five of them in the box, and uh, I have no idea what I'm going to do with them, but I thought I'd show and tell them. So if well, anybody great. wants one, you know, they contact me. That's pretty cool stuff. You never know what you're going to find at a swap meet. And, uh, that's for sure. That's some of the fun of it. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, any other show and tells? Yes, uh, I think I'll go next. Okay, Larry. Okay, this is going to, talking about the cradles, uh, Tom Zaksik presented a, a, a paper and a presentation about a month or two ago, and I'm going to talk about those cradles. And this is, this is the heart of what he presented. It's a, uh, Four pieces of power tech T rail. Uh, you buy them. This this was bought in a 36 inch length, and the 36 inches this piece plus this piece. So this took two sticks. 20 by 16 or 20 by 16. So this is what you get. Um, you have to. You have to, in these, you have to drill two holes to take the quarter inch T slot T nuts or T bolts. And in the longer pieces, you have to attach the corner brackets. And, and that makes up the basic part of the frame. So if you can imagine this, and you make two end brackets and you slap them on this side and then present and then make uh, braces across it so these things don't wobble. You end up with, I'll show you here, you end up with this. So we have, whoops, out of sight. We have the cradle down at the bottom or the T rail. We have the two end frames. And stabilizer bars. Now these bars can be anything because all they do is keep this from moving around. I've got an aluminum bar here. And I got a wooden bar here. They can be anything. This can be an all thread rod. Just anything that's uh, 
strong enough to allow you to manhandle it. So what I've got mounted in here is a uh, Atwater 1035 that I'm working on. And the cradle allows access from any position. You can work on it in this position, or you can work on it from this position, or that position. You mounted that from the front? Pardon me? You mounted that chassis from the front of the chassis? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, the uh, AK-35 is mounted when, it, when it's in its box, it's mounted on the front panel. So in the chassis, it's connected by you can't see it. It's connected by L bracket. That's all of you. L brackets holding the panel to the rail. Oh, that's a better view for you guys. There's L brackets here holding the front panel to the rail. Um, these holes in the end wood frame allow you to bring out the power cords or anything else, but they're great handholds for flipping this thing around. Now, if, if anybody wants to make one of these, um, I have made bad drawings and make CAD drawings of everything such as that, or my end frames, or even the uh, T-rails. And if anybody wants these, these drawings, they're in PDF format. I'm willing to share them. Uh, just send me an email uh, saying you want You'd like me to forward you the drawing. I'll do that. Well, that's great, Larry. That's that's pretty pretty awesome. You know, I think somebody famous once said everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I think you've achieved that. And uh, thank you, Tom. That's that's great. You, so that's I'll put my email in the, in the chat in the chat room that you can respond to if anybody wants a drawing. That's great, yeah. That's that's a wonderful thing, and uh, we could even maybe put those files, uh, that PDF file, on our website, the ARCI website, if anybody wants to build one of these things. So that's great, excellent work there, Larry. Any other show and tells for us today? Yeah, actually, if we got some time, I'd like to ask a question, mostly for Charlie and Dale. In have you, is, does this look like a true Radiola 3 brand new in the box? Um, Have you guys ever seen an original box from a Radiola 3? I've, I've never seen one, but for some reason it looks odd. <laughs> well, well uh, Art, if you flip that around, it's got the stamp on it for the, uh, the box uh, maker. There's a round circle with. Yeah, no, I was looking. For, yep, there it is. I don't think they had that when Radio Threes were invented. It was General Fiber Box. It's dated 1925. Okay, I didn't. I didn't think they were marking boxes that way back in 1925. Yeah, yeah. I mean the date's okay, but the box seems doesn't look quite right to me. Yeah, I didn't either. It, it, you know, and while the top is still sealed, uh, when I bought it, it has been opened on the bottom. Because I was curious to see what was in there. <laughs> and it truly is a Radiola 3 with the brass base WD-11 still wrapped in horsehair. Hmm. I think well, I've, I've never seen a Radiola 3 box anywhere else, so I can't compare that to anything. That's what I figured. If you guys didn't 
if you guys knew, you know, if anybody knew, you guys would know. Yeah, I don't, uh, I haven't seen one before, so I, I don't know if it's real or <laughs> it's. Yeah, I, I know. It's just, it's, it's weird. I keep it sealed. I don't, I, you know, I don't open it up, you know, to take the radio out to display it. I'd actually just display the box like it is. Yeah. Is it, can you, can you show that again? Is, does it have a, a, a Roman is. numeral three? See, radiola, that was all a Roman numeral three, not a, not the Arabic number three. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. It's got a serial number penciled in on it. The, the box information that um, Tom was referencing to does date 1925. So that's, I'm just not aware of, like I say, all that kind of packing information and stuff back in the 20s. I I, that looks more recent. <laughs> well, I, and I agree with you. That's why I was asking you guys the question. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah. I question the number on it. It's the, uh, the Arabic number three versus the Roman numeral three. Yeah, if it's an Arabic three, that's a clue that there's something wrong. Because it, right. it should be a Roman numeral three. If somebody created this box as a fantasy piece, they did a damn good job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess they even fake out uh, mummies in Egypt and stuff anymore. So I guess there's some pretty good people. Yeah, but but that would be for something that was worth millions of dollars, not a couple of hundred. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hopefully. a couple of hundred would even be high. Yeah. Well, I bought this at Radio Fest back when we were still in Elgin. And an old uh, woman came up, and her husband had passed away, and I bought most of her stuff. Hopefully, it's just not a box with a brick in it. No, no, no. The radio's in there. Because I have opened the bottom to see. Okay. So, who knows? Maybe in, maybe in another presentation here, I will open it in front of the group. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would think the radio should be displayed if it's if it's still in box condition. Probably deserves a place on your shelf somewhere. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a toss up. Like I said, I have. I don't think I. I think it's the only battery set I have left. Uh, I unfortunately had to sell most of those when I moved, um, and just didn't have the room. I only have one speaker horn, one battery set. And that's about that. That's really it. Besides what I already showed you guys. Yeah, you said the tubes are wrapped with horsehair. Yeah. Is there a paper wrapping as well, or? I don't remember, Dale. It's been okay. probably ten years since I opened opened this. You know, so like I said, it may be one of those things. I, I think what I'm going to do, and Tom said, me, I'm going to reach out and see if this uh, box company still exists. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey uh, <laughs> all right, uh, why don't you just open it up for us and let us look ourselves. <laughs> next time, Rudy. <laughs> yeah, maybe next time. So, yeah, that'd be a good show and tell next time. The You know, we could have a drum roll and you could open it up. And... I, could, I, I had it open once, like I said, because I did have to verify there was something in here. I think we need Geraldo Rivera on your end then if we're going to open it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, any other show and tells for today? Just publicize that Radio 3 uh, box for the next meeting and then open it up. You get a lot of viewers just to see what it is. Yeah. But you got to publicize it. Well, I have something that I, I want to share. It's more of a request for information here, but I've got this germanium transistor with this logo on top. And um, it's a it's a 2N445A, but it's got this logo with an A with a, looks like a halo or a football on top of it. 
And uh, it reminds me of the California Angels baseball team, you know, with the little halo on top of the A. But does anybody have any idea what company made this transistor? That also looks like an inside divider. If, you know, the, draw, the drawing of it. Of which? Of your, the logo with the, at the A. It almost looks like an inside uh, divider. If you know what inside dividers are. To check the inside the, uh, of, a, uh, of a hole or something. Because it's got the two little feet on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Well, I'm looking for information on it. I just, yeah. I have... I had a box of old transistors and there are a few of these in there and it's, uh, you know, it's probably from the 1950s, early 1960s. I would also suggest that it may be East European or Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you could answer that by showing the uh, marking of the, uh, uh, of whatever 2N number or is on the side of it. Uh, yeah, well, I, I got that. It just looks like a regular old font. You know, there's nothing unusual about it. I can, you know, probably no way to show that here. But uh, uh, anyway, that's, I'll stop sharing. But uh, if, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's just really hard to see. It doesn't look like anything. The font doesn't look like anything that's foreign, that's, I guess. What's the number on it? It's a 2N45A. 2N45A? 445A. It's a, it's a germanium transistor. You know, this is before silicon. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's all I had. But, uh, any other show and tells? Today, other, other than that, uh, we'll just move on then to the items wanted items for sale. And I'll, uh, Matt's put the poll question up there just to give, give us an idea how many people are going to do this today. And then I'll turn it over to Tom Kleinschmidt and he'll moderate this part of it. Your job may be easy, Tom. Doesn't look like anyone. Well, we have a lot of people that have put up their ads in the uh, in, in the, the chat, chat window chat window already, which is excellent. And by the way, you all did a good job of putting who you are, what you had, and how to contact you. So uh, looks like we got that covered. So I guess we get to move on to the next step here. This is a quick update. This General Fiber Box Company does date back to 1925. The owner died in 1970 at age 80-something. We're doing real-time research here. This is cool. That takes us to the end of our regularly moderated portions of this meeting. And that means we're going to move on to the open session, which is an unmoderated conversation about anything you guys want to talk about that's relevant to this hobby. So with that being said, I'll say thanks very much, everyone, for participating today, and we'll see you next month. Thanks.